Hello, everyone. Um, adjust the microphone really quick here. My name is Michelle Krasowski, and I am a librarian and a graduate of New College of Florida. I know we had another. Ooh, hello, New College! My noble collegians! <laughs> um, and I have done book talks in the past as a um, youth services librarian, but obviously this is a much different collection than um, I've told the uh, first and second graders in my life about. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a quote um, that I uh, found really resonated with me when I went to um, a presentation about the Druid Heights artist community of, outside of Mill Valley recently. Um, and that was, in Western civilization, our elders are books. And that's a quote by Gary Snyder. And when I heard that quote, it resonated with me since it illustrates the divide between generations many people in our society have and the resulting lost opportunity for wisdom and insight to be passed down from one generation to the next. And unlike many traditional cultures, we don't have as much interpersonal transmission of knowledge and as a result, we can be left adrift, uh, stranded, and highly suggestible to anyone who asserts themselves as having a position of authority. Because whether or not a societal structure exists for us to provide one, we still have the need as social creatures to seek out help and have the need for guidance when finding our way in the world. And we, stu uh, we do still have the right to make our own choices about whose guidance we will seek and accept, and we do have options, even though not everybody necessarily realizes it. Um, I'm sure everybody <laughs> in this room does, but we will encounter people in the world that unfortunately do not. Um, and whether or not reali people realize this um, is the other matter, and I feel it is important to remind people that they do have this choice. So I've come here today to share some information resources that I have identified as being helpful to provide a more factually, historically, and scientifically based perspective to augment the information that is being supplied through school drug education programs and through the media. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to understand the disparity between the information that was being given to me through the D.A.R.E. program in school and the richer cultural and historical background of the sacred substances that were only presented in the context of the profane in my public school classroom. And I had a family that understood the importance of the culture of spirituality and respect for the visions of interconnectedness of all life that these plants could provide when used in that way. I learned the difference between use and abuse. I learned respect for the powerful spirits in these plants and in ourselves. I learned that negative and harmful experiences can come from disrespecting the power that entheogens have. And I was fortunate to have this alternative perspective. And many of us who have been fortunate enough to learn the respectful role of mind-altering substances have found the paths to further our research on the subject. Some people here synthesizing new perspectives from the many sources that they have come into contact with. And there are still many people out there who never got the opportunity to find out the truth, rich history, respect, actual benefits, and harms of these substances based on scientific research. I believe they have the right to know this information so they can make responsible decisions and have the opportunity to re-examine their opinions which were sometimes preformed and handed to them without their active participation in the process of learning. And thankfully, there are many excellent resources out there, and new ones are coming out as our community grows in number and volume. And tonight, I'm going to share with you a few that I find to be very exciting and inspiring that you may want to keep in mind to recommend to others who have an information gap to fill or to explore on your own. So I've got a big stack here, <laughs> and I'm going to be um, talking briefly about a few of them, and some I didn't get a chance to do write-ups of, but let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so the first book I'll be talking about this evening is Drugs Without the Hot Air by David Vethuga, which recently came out uh, this past year in 2012. Um, a little bit about David Nutt. In January 2008, he was appointed as the chairman of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs in Great Britain, the ACMD. As chairman, he repeatedly clashed with the government ministers over issues of drug harm and classification, including the publication of a pamphlet containing a lecture Nutt had given to the Center, of Crime, Center for Crime and Justice Studies at King's College, London, in July 2009. 
In this, Nutt repeated his familiar view that illicit drugs should be classified according to the actual evidence of the harm they cause. Following the release of this pamphlet, Nutt was dismissed from his ACMD position. He announced that he and a number of his colleagues that, also, that had also resigned from the ACMD had set up an independent scientific committee on drugs, and this book contains those findings. So I was excited to find this book because it is a comprehensive and easily readable review of what are generally considered recreational drugs with straightforward information on how they work, why we take them, their harms and benefits, and it does so with a scientifically grounded approach that also factors in the social and cultural aspects of their consumption. It also addresses the governmental policies behind the legal status of different substances, mostly from Great Britain, but from the United States as well. And it provides logical, rational insight into the ways these policies need to be adjusted so that people can have a, an accurate sense of relative harms and benefits of substances rather than an arbitrary, reactionary, and fear-based regulatory system that results in mo more overall harm than help. And over the years, I have thought a lot about what would, what would be included in a responsible drug education program that truly prepared students to make well-informed life choices. And this book is an excellent candidate to be the basis of a better curriculum, in my opinion. Some of the parts of this book that I find particularly fascinating were the sections that talked about our, the coevolution of plants, insects, and mammals throughout life on Earth, and the interplay between our neurochemistry and the plant's defense mechanisms. So the reasons why we co-evolved with the, these um, substances that complemented or um, affected each other in our um, biochemistry. And um, other interesting parts were the indigenous local plant substances and how these spread between regions with exploration and trade. The increased risk factors for addiction that comes with isolating chemicals from plants and synthesizing them versus using them in the form closer to their plant of origin. And the political influence of the Egyptian cotton and American wood pulp industries in the efforts to ban hemp, rebranded in the US as marijuana and not understood to be the same plant source as cannabis by many health practitioners at the time of the campaign to rest restrict its propagation. So that is um, David Nutt, Drugs Without the Hot Air, Minimizing the Harms of Legal and Illegal Drugs, and I highly recommend it. It's full of really wonderful information. And I wanted to um, apologize that I'm reading off of this um, script. Um, if I had given myself more time to prepare, I like to better familiarize myself so I can look at all of you while I'm talking. So I apologize for my minimal eye contact. So You're doing I'll, awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so nice to be here, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to have you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, so let's see what's next. All right, our next book is Busted Drug War Survival Skills by M. Chris Fabricant. So no matter what context people may use sacred substances in, if they are considered illegal under federal law and are not being used in a community and context that has the protected right to do so under religious freedom, the user is at legal risk when in possession and in some cases when under the influence of these substances. And this is another aspect of our culture where, where there is a lot of misinformation being circulated that can lead to poor decision making and people unknowingly surrendering their constitutionally protected rights. Busted is chock full of powerful information with a humorous delivery meant to engage the most countercultural of readers, but useful to people from all walks of life. The odds are stacked against you. The drug war is a dirty war where the criminal justice system doesn't play fair, and knowledge is your only defense. This book reviews what constitutes different levels of possession, the intricacies of search and seizure, which can affect you whether or not you are participating in any illegal activity, how to handle yourself if you do get busted, the legal process and what to expect, and an easy to remember busted 10 commandments. So that's busted. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that I was interested in choosing books that are available freely through our public library system. So this book is from the um, San Francisco Public Library main branch. You can check it out once I return it, although I think there are a number of holds on it. So put yourself on the list. And you might have it in your library here. I haven't checked that yet. Um, Busted is also an item from the San Francisco Public Library System. And I will be um, putting a list of the books that I'm reviewing tonight on the Meetup page so that you can refer back to them um, if you're interested in following up and reading them yourself. Okay. This next book 
book was um, a copy from my personal collection. I am not sure if it's available through any of our library resources, but you know, look it up as we say in the library world. <laughs> so this is LSD, <laughs> LSD My Problem Child by Albert Hoffman. LSD 25 has been taken so far from the hands of its synthesizer, Albert Hoffman, and the scientific community that saw its profound impact on consciousness, and one outcome has been its resulting legal inaccessibility to those who wish to use it in a safe and respectful manner. Since it was introduced into our Western culture on a wide scale in an uncontrolled way, many people do not know its origin as a pharmaceutical grade medicine or its early use in psychiatric research. This book is important because it brings the dialogue back to Dr. Hoffman, acknowledging LSD's origins and the potential for healing on an individual and interpersonal universal level, once again validating its place in the scientific community and giving it the respect it deserves. As a major contributor to science and as an individual with a broad and informed perspective, I believe that he deserves the chance for his views about the implications of his discovery to be understood and considered by those who hold their own opinions about its impact on our society. So this is the um, newest edition of LSD My Problem Child, um, published by the um, Maps Press. And um, the project editor on this is a, is a close friend of mine. <laughs> to see your name in there. Right. Okay, and then this next uh, book, so beautiful. Plants of the Gods, um, Their Sacred Healing and Hallucinogenic Powers by Richard Evan Schultes, Albert Hoffman, and Christian Rich. And this book is available um, at the SFPL main branch um, for library use only, and it is also available in the collection of the San Francisco Botanical Gardens Library, which is open every day except for Tuesday from 10 to 4. Um, I've recently um, been training as a docent at the Botanical Gardens, and it's been really wonderful to be around all of the plants in the garden and learn a little bit more about each of their unique lives and um, their, their own places in the world. And lots of times I feel like we think of plants as what can they do for us and um, what is their meaning to us and forget that they are their own beings too and they have their own lives and their own purposes whether or not we even ever come into contact with them. So, um, Plants of the Gods. This is the revised and expanded edition released in 1998 of Schultes and Hoffman's Ethnobotanical and Ethnopharm <laughs> Ethnopharmacological Milestone, which was first published in 1992 and was written for the purpose of educating the concerned public about the important role hallucinogenic and consciousness expanding plants have played in the human experience for millennia. It is filled with beautiful pictures of plants, people engaged in ritual use, and artwork inspired by the visions these experiences have brought to different cultures around the world. The information within is presented in a botanical and cultural context, making it an accessible reference source that gives a new appreciation to, of the amazing range of plants and instills a respect for them as a life form as diverse and powerful as our own. Useful sections include a plant lexicon with a genus, author, and the number of plants known to exist in each genus, botanical name of the species shown, plant family, reference number, geographical distribution, and common names. It also includes a table overview of plant use with common names, type of plant, botanical name, usage history and ethnography, usage context and purpose, preparation, and chemical components and effects. So as our last speaker mentioned, oh yes, yes okay. Um, as, our, as our last speaker mentioned, remind me of your name? Yelena, um, there are so many plants that um, are out there that are so significant and spiritual that we may have never heard of or we may have not come into contact with. And this is really um, a great resource with the beautiful pictures, information organized into the tabular for format, and little descriptions of all different types of uses throughout history and ritual throughout the world. And there's our Kathy Vine. My previous residence was um, in Sarasota at the house that Rick Doblin built, and we had a Kathy Vine in our backyard, and each year we would have um, 
bugs that would visit it as their special pollinators. And it was really wonderful to see them <laughs> come by each time. I have no idea what they were. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to wrap this up in a few more minutes and quickly talk about two more books. Here we go. This next one is The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by Dr. James Fadiman. This is a library item from the San, San Carlos Library in the San Mateo County Library System. Um, this is an excellent resource to properly prepare those who choose to take entheogens but who may not have access to a guide. This book contains guidelines for spiritual and scientific sessions so that those who choose to take or offer a psychedelic um, may do so with greater confidence and safety. It describes well-researched uses of psychedelics to advance a spiritual quest for healing, for personal exploration and psychotherapy, and for facilitating scientific exploration and invention. Information includes guidelines for conducting or being guided in sacred sessions, established use of psychedelics in therapeutic settings, the use of applying psychedelic sessions to facilitate problem solving in science and technology, emerging directions of use and current trends and possibilities, a checklist for those seriously intending to be a guide um, or have a guided experience to quickly and easily be sure all bases are covered and specific, specific data on all the topics covered in the book. And if you have anything to add or share with Dr. Fadiman, he provides his web address and his thanks. And the last book that I'm going to talk about this evening um, is also one from my personal collection. Um, this is a relatively new book and I'm very excited to dig into this. I just got it this week. Mm. Okay, so this is Psychedelia by pa Patrick Lindborg. This book is a pioneering effort that presents psychedelia as a culture and lifestyle with its own history, philosophy, art, visions, and traditions. Over the course of 500 pages, the past, present, and future of psychedelia are presented, the fruit of 20 years of research by one of the leading scholars in the field. The content is presented in two cycles of psychedelic culture, one that begins with the hallucinogenic rites at Eleusis, Eleusis and uh, ends in Albert Hoffman's laboratory during World War II. Matters of anthropology, philosophy, pharmacology, ethnobotany, shamanism, occultism, and classic drama and poetry are examined. The second and shorter cycle deals with the post-war era up to the present day and is oriented towards psychedelic art and pop culture, layman drug use, psychedelia's co connections for Western socioculture, neo-shamanism, and the future implications of psychedelics. And Lindbergh asserts that if the 2000s are to be the century of the brain, the psychedelics will prove to be more important than they've been already. Okay, so I also wanted to mention um, the website arrowid.org, which is a really wonderful place to go for information or to refer people to um, information on um, different substances, their dosage and usage, trip reports, and also a wonderful list of uh, other books, including these, and then books on other topics as well. Um, and um, they are also uh, Novo Collegians and um, librarians, so it's really wonderful um, the work that they're doing. Um, so I also wanted to mention um, the website entheoguide.net and psychedelicexplorersguide.com. Those are the websites of Dr. James Fadiman, where you can give your feedback um, requested in the book. And lysergia.com is the website of Patrick Lindborg, which you can also refer to. And then, of course, maps.org is a wonderful website and organization. So I'm sure you all know about that. Okay, so that's, um, that's what I have to say. So thank you so much. <laughs> Are you seeing a shift in, in libraries now, or how do you flow with this type of information? 
Well, I would have to say that the major shift that I've seen comes from my personal geographic relocation because I just moved out to the Bay Area from Florida four years ago. So there are certainly books that are in the collections out here that you would not find in a public library in Florida. And that's really um, fascinating to see and uh, really wonderful too. And hopefully um, it will continue um, to be supported by our um, open-minded um, community and, and library system. Um, I was surprised to find that some of these books that I could find at the public library were not in um, the collection here at the school. So um, I would recommend that if they're interested, they should um, add some more <laughs> of maybe these titles to the collection. Um, and yeah, there, it seems like there's more momentum um, building and more really wonderful research coming to a culmination all the time. So it's exciting to see these works, um, especially the psychedelia and um, the uh, David Nutt Drugs Without, all, Drugs Without the Hot Air uh, books. Um, and oh yeah, I also wanted to mention that I'm currently working with my partner Jeff Frame on a project to um, help finally launched the Haight-Ashbury Museum of Psychedelic Art and History in the Bay Area. <laughs> so we're um, just submitting our nonprofit status now, and I'm really hoping that we will have a reading room there as well. So I'm excited about um, the possibility of being a center for people that want to read or want to do research on the particular subject. So, thanks. Thank you.